people who are working, do you plan on staying with the companies that you are at? Or you can get away from I work at a hockey rink, the third arena. Okay. So what's your like positioning now versus where you the trajectory of where you're looking to? Uh, so when I first started, I was just as like a customer service associate, so working like the front desk, like as needed, like scorekeeping the adult league games. I'm still doing that now, but now I like am more of like a supervisor role where I can open and close the rink as okay. well. And so like eventually, I want to be working with the marketing team there. So that's your goal. Yeah. With the marketing team. Okay. Great. How long do you think that'll take? Uh, I was talking with someone about supervisors because in May I'll be there two years. So they kind of want me to start working there more so after I graduate. Right. Um, you feel what you'll be getting paid will match your value or yeah. your work? Great. Who else? You're, you're working, right? Yeah. What are, you, what are you doing? I'm a banker at Citibank. Okay. I started off as a teller and then I worked up, I'm a banker right now. And before Personal I, banker? Yes. Okay. Before all I had to do was a teller, I can only do teller transactions like withdrawals and deposits. Yeah. And now I can open accounts, just like the credit cards, personal loans, stuff like that. Okay. When you were a teller, did they cross train for any of those sort of extra? Yeah, things? yeah. Yeah, they did. I, I could apply uh, for credit cards as a teller, but everything else like opening accounts, I couldn't do that. And okay. Like, yeah, I guess. So what's uh, what's the goal? I would say like work more with like the wealth management team. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe like an investment banker, get my yeah. stock broker's license, stuff like that. Series 7 and 3, yeah. and 6. Series 7 and 3. Series 7 and 3. Series 6. 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 Series 6
by anybody else? All right, you guys are getting ready to graduate in May, right? Looking for employment, looking for jobs. What are you working on? Right. They're going to promote a salary to you or an hourly job, which is fine. That's their position, right? Get ready to graduate. What are you working? What are you worth right now? What do you think you're worth per year? What do you think you're worth per year? You can throw a number out there. You haven't thought about it much, huh? You guys, I'm a French student. What are you worth per year? I said it was probably like a student. No. <laughs> you. I would say almost nothing since I have only theoretical knowledge. I don't have a uh, valuable experience in work life, so I would say almost nothing. You're worth nothing to to an employer. I mean, so what if they they offer you ten thousand dollars a year? It's good. Is it not? Maybe. All right, well, you? At least 24 k 24,000 a year. 24. 24,000. At least. US. Uh, no, at least. Oh, euros. 24,000 euros. Yeah. A year. Yeah. Very good. What kind of a lifestyle do you plan? Do you want to buy cars, a house, a apartment, condo? Start a family. It's mostly about the value of the job, but more than uh, what I want to do with it. Okay. So twenty-four thousand a year is maybe worth it. Thirty-two to thirty-three, thirty thousand. It's a starting position. So twenty-four thousand US. Yeah. It's not much. No, that's fine. Okay, you sir. Um, at the very least, actually, what's the legal minimum wage? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> type it in, Google it. What's the federal? I know Illinois may have it different. I just stand in Illinois, just type in Illinois. Illinois, like 10 something, I think. Oh, wow. Just about an hour, 16. Yeah. Okay, 13 an hour, and multiply that by the 40 hour work week. And then. Yeah, about 27,000 more or less because. Uh, again, all I have for the most part is knowledge of theory. I, at this point, I do have some work experience, but not sure if, if it's enough to prove myself just yet. Um, so at the very least, I'm sure Trump might look at me as like at least being worth the bare minimum because I have quite a bit to prove. Twenty-seven thousand dollars a year. What kind of lifestyle you expect? Um, so like, to start the business? How are you going to start the business? Save money. Well, um, I do want to try to look to see where uh, I can somewhat reach into the entertainment industry. Um, not sure exactly just yet, but I do think maybe at some point building connections with the wrestling industry or other related uh, media companies for sure, at least getting some sort of networking <coughs> connections. Um, just build some companies out there, um, fight. They are well known for streaming, for combat sports, um, and for merchandise. So really, you gotta build up your connections because so you yeah. use some of that money you get from the salary, twenty eight thousand a year, pay for an apartment, utilities, go out to eat, and they go to museums and stuff, go dates and a car, and, right? And we're saying this is before taxes, right? Uh, take away, just subtract twenty five percent from that. Point is that that's twenty years unrealistic. Point is twenty years like. Might as well just get government assistance. Like, mm -hmm. You know, could have made more than that. 
I'll come back to the reason why I'm talking about this. But you, sir, what do you work? Graduating in May. Probably an entry level job, maybe like 40K. Um, I don't really got much work experience exactly in the field that I, I mean, I have work experience, but I don't have work experience in the field that I want to go into. So probably an entry level job around 40K. Okay, so 40,000. <coughs> Before taxes, thirty thousand a year after. What are they gonna? What are you? What are you expecting them to offer you? What are they gonna pay me? What do you think? Yeah. Or do you already know what they're yeah. gonna pay you? Yeah. Okay. Well, what are, well, I mean, you don't know how much. But give us a, a roundabout or something. Seventy thousand. All right. So we got one person. <coughs> right. It says seventy thousand dollars. You don't live in Chicago or the suburbs? Chicago. All right. That sounds more realistic. That sounds realistic to just have a normal, normal, like be able to go out, go to the movies, go eat, date, get a decent car, decent apartment, right? In fact, they take away taxes, probably about 58 or something. But, okay, so 70 grand. So we say the numbers are different on what people value themselves at. Would you have taken an, a lower number? Um, yeah, that that was just what they offer, like the starting level, and plus I did their internship last summer, so I was expecting around that number because of what other interns were saying that they were going to get paid once they started. Okay. All right. So financial industry, you sir, you ready to graduate? What's your work out there in the marketplace? Sixty seventy. And where are you going to be applying? Like what market, what industry, what job? Um, well, I was thinking more, um, well, I mean, it kind of depends on what I do. There's like some stuff I don't understand how I am, but if I go um, an entry level job um, at my um, local, I mean, not my local, like my brother works at a accounting firm and they kind of offer me some, so it's an entry level, like 60 grand. Okay. Uh, how about you here in the, in the front? Yeah. Uh, I currently work as a pizza delivery driver. Yeah, I'm not going to stay there. Uh, as for what I want to do, maybe go to a different coaching somewhere down the line, along the line. But as of right now, it's kind of just going to be. You graduate in May, right? Yeah. Okay, so what are your expectations for what you do? Like, what's your worth right now to yourself? Yeah. Out in the marketplace. Whatever they pay me. So you take whatever you could get? Yeah. Job or just money? Both. Okay. All right. Um, did I ask you what your work? Uh, I, you did, yeah, but um, I think between like at least 50,000 so, a year. Okay, 50,000. You've been living in the burbs or in Chicago? Uh, my parents and I will be moving to the suburbs. So I'll live at home for a little bit okay. while I finish. I'm going to do my master's program as well. So I'll finish doing that up and then see where I'm working, see what's going on with financial wise, and then eventually get my own house. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Did I ask you? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, that's 
in Texas, so the cost of living is a bit lower. Yeah. Um, and you're going back after you graduate? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, <coughs> and so I probably, my my partner has no college degree and they're making about 40, 45K. Mm -hmm. I figured mine would probably be higher than that um, with the college degree, which is 70 to 50, 60. Stand in the city or the suburb? Um, I live in Humble <coughs> Park. Where? Humble Park. Okay. Humble Park? Uh, our, our we, we lived there shortly on North Avenue in California. Oh, you said Humble Park? I said Elmore Park. Elmore Park. Oh, okay. There you go. So, North and Harlem area. Yeah. All right. What's the point of this? Right. The point of this is you've been in college for four years, right? We're studying process, procedures, planning, strategies, step by step, remove something that it doesn't work, how to improve efficiency. Have you thought about this stuff? Where would you like to work? Number one, before we get to that, <clears throat> saying you want jobs, are you actually gonna enjoy this work? Right? If you're not gonna enjoy the work, the job will be gone before you even know it. So first is thinking your own choices and decision making before you start thinking about people's products, people's services, and the people that you're gonna work on. What is your actual process for making sound decisions for yourself? Because you want a certain lifestyle, take it, right? <clears throat> and if you haven't thought about that, you're basically pigeonholing yourself into something you're probably gonna hate, right? So just speaking as a person who's Went through MBAs, seen all the people get the jobs, all this different stuff. Most people end up in positions that they hate and that are stuck because the money is halfway decent. And even if it's not halfway decent, you made life choices to where you can't be, right? You had kids, a family, you took on an insurmountable uh, amount of debt. So process, so we begin this <coughs> work breakdown structure, right? We're studying stuff, how do you break down the work? What's your objective for your product or this project you're doing? This all corresponds to just personal life. Your own personal life, like do you have a mission statement? Do you have an objective? Do you have a vision? Do you know where you wanna work? Do you know where you wanna live? Do you know the cost of living where you wanna live? Based on the type of lifestyle that you want, and then come up to the determination of your value. Now, I think most people say 60, 50, 40 because they just think that's the normal of anybody coming out of college. But you're like, well, who came up with that number? Who normalized that, right? Has it been normalized on purpose from employers? Like, kind of regurgitated through the university system as to what people who start? Because <clears throat> honestly, I would say coming out of business school at least 80 to 90 thousand dollars. It was 40 to 50 when I graduated with a bachelor's degree. That was like the standard. And this is, you know, from time later, we're still saying the same numbers with the amount of inflation that has occurred in time being. It doesn't make much sense. <clears throat> so as we move through this, looking at uh, breakdown structures, objectives, and your ideas. It starts with you, your own personal life, before you get into these great plans. Do you process your thoughts and ideas correctly based on your value? Remember we said two separate things. There's the price of something, right? I'm gonna pay you and I give the money. And there's the value of something. What is this actually thing worth beyond the price? Is this education worth what you're saying your salary is gonna be <clears throat> over X amount of years. If not, we need to reevaluate maybe even the education itself. Right? Because education has to uh, financially compensate and make sense. It has to make sense because the amount of debt taken on will be there. You have to do something. And for the most part, if you don't make X amount of money, the debt's never going to go away. It takes about 10, 15, 20 years. So I say, don't sell yourself short. Maybe really selling yourself short 
And as competitors in the marketplace against one another, you're competing against one another, you guys should be, the number should be greater as the more people ask, right? If you're competing, you're saying, well, am I a better product? Second part is like, hey, I don't have any work experience. <clears throat> you're like, oh, okay, well, that's objective, right? You don't have work experience in that particular detailed job they're asking for. You have life experience, you have travel experience. You may have worked on a project at home. You may have worked at projects at school. You've done presentations and PowerPoints at school. All of that stuff should be gathered together to present to companies to show that you do have some sort of value. So what is your work experience? Concordia University. Your work experience is this school. You've, you've sacrificed four years of not working full time so you can be here to take these courses and learn all this different stuff. So you should be applying your projects that you've done, your presentations, anything else you've done in school should be structured together as a portfolio to present to whatever employers you're trying to get to say, here's my body of work. Body of work, emphasize, right? Work experience. Your work experience has been using your intelligence over the time, but you have done work, right? So that's the huge misconception. And I think if it's applied wrong, most people I see this say, oh, I just applied a thousand places and nobody called me. Because if you're really selling yourself short, you're not advertising yourself properly, right? You're advertising yourself as somebody who's never done anything. And you can't, you know, that doesn't make sense, right? So you're constraining yourself as we talk about constraining management. You're placing bottlenecks on yourself as we talk about bottlenecks, right? So we have to think of ways to apply this. When we graduate in May, to say, how do we make this more efficient and more effective so that we optimize? Say 80, 90K. 80, 90K at minimum. Because that num those numbers you told me, as a person who's lived quite a few places and seen people make all types of financial decisions, that's just a basic lifestyle in Chicago. It was like extremely, after the taxes, because that number is just a fictitious number. It's gone after you pay health insurance, federal taxes, state taxes, <clears throat> social security, et cetera, et cetera. That number is, should never think about that number. I always think about <laughs> the number after everything is gone, right? So you just think about what you actually take home. Don't think about some number that is, has no really real bearing or real day-to-day -day lifestyle. So I say 80, 90K if you want to have just a minimal, decent quality of life. Uh, 30K, poverty. I don't even know. You might be struggling by yourself a cup of coffee and stuff, you know? Living like in a crappy apartment in the basement somewhere. But why sell yourself short, right? You should have a lot more. Um... And the second part is, too, is you really can think big. The bigger you think about yourself, the greater possibilities you'll be able to achieve at least minimum um, some sort of greatness, right? I knew that when I started my business, I was like, well, I started to have some struggles on getting people to invest that I knew. I didn't know enough people that have money. And then I was like, well, I can't get millions of dollars a month from the bank. So I could go back to the drawing board, think of some very savvy, creative ways, right? Looking at hedge fund managers, things like that, to be like, I need other people's money, not bank money. I need other people's private money. And guess what? There's a lot of money out there for people to just give to you, but just no one's asking. Because people don't really value themselves that high. They don't think they could do it. I'm 100% sure you can do whatever it is you want to do if you actually believe it. Okay, so constraints, theory of constraints. Before we get to that, who got their um, wrap up the objectives? Some people didn't speak about their objective, what they're gonna kind of focus on. Who wants to tell us about their objectives that haven't spoken? Their project objectives. Who hasn't told us about their objectives? 
if you think more about yours, put your um, custom uh, cardio. differentiate yourself, maybe, yeah. right? Like, how do you stand out among other competitors? Okay. How about you, sir? What is, yeah, for your right, right? Get a chance to do that you. Yeah, have you thought about it at least? Um, a little bit, but it's not the most that I can really speak about. Well, what's your, what's your uh, main idea? <coughs> uh, open up a bait and tackle shop. It's like a fishing store. Okay, that sounds um, interesting. So it's kind of like a lack of home, like where I am. So to do like the best pro shots, you have to know it because those are all like 30 miles, like standard apart. Mm. Um, so you kind of need something in between. And the ones so far that are in between there are doing pretty well, but I need one out by where I live. And these would be primarily in the suburbs, though? Just yeah, if I some, yeah, because you have Fox River out by where I am, yeah. which kind of need people kind of drive pretty far to go to different tackle shops. So if I put one right in that area, I think it would do pretty well. How would you deal with the seasonality, like the change in the season? Well, there's ice fishing too that a lot of people do out there. So it'd be pretty steady. I would just try to change the stock of what lures I have. Okay. Yeah, I, didn't get, I don't think I heard your um, idea. How about you in the back? What is your idea? Um, just open up like a, a Chinese food store here on campus. Did yeah. you mention this? No, I didn't mention it. Okay. Uh, the uh, Chinese restaurant yeah. on campus here at Dominican? Yeah. Uh, like downstairs in the bedroom. Downstairs? Yeah. So what would that look like? Like and it'll just like be another spot, another type of food that people could eat and then have it open a little bit later at night. So that people are able to, you know, go in after ten. What what's some of the challenges with that that you see? Uh, I mean there's there's competitors down there. It's kind of like a mini food store. Uh, I mean, observing the other food, food little restaurants, the station here at uh, Concordia, what do you think some of their challenges for making money? It's on campus. Uh -huh. So it's like mainly just students that are going to be doing there. Uh, so a limited amount of customers, you yeah. say? Yeah. Maybe the times in which it was places are open. Okay. Uh, who else? Who haven't spoke on their idea? How about you? Have you told your idea? Yeah, mine is the furniture. Oh, yeah. Okay. Is there anybody left out? Yeah. Yes, I want to open um, a new boxing gym, like in the suburbs. I feel like it's there isn't enough boxing gyms in here in the suburbs. In the city, there might be, mm -hmm. but like around here in the suburbs, there's a very limited amount. And I feel like the amount we have, they're overpriced. Like I know, like the memberships monthly are like one hundred and fifty dollars, and I feel like there is a lot of difficulties in opening a, a gym. Like there's a lot of startup costs. Like brand and boxing equipment is very expensive, and like finding good personnel that's like passionate about it. But I feel like since coming from, because my family is like a boxing family, I have all moms who had an amateur career, and I feel like since you know the family is very passionate about it, I feel like that passion is going to help me in the long run. Okay. Yeah. 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 Have you ever been to Hamlin Park? No, no. Okay, yeah, I just boxed here for like 10 years. Oh, did you? No way. Uh, it fluctuated. It's like middle, it's like light, sometimes oh. light, heavyweight, sometimes middle. Because over the range of time, you know, it's just like waves and stuff like that. Yeah. But yeah, I didn't do Golden Gloves or anything. But just, you know, That's how I, I want to do Golden Gloves. Yeah. Um, okay, so what's the challenge? <clears throat> like looking at what you see out there for boxing gyms, because I don't see one. Yeah. Which means like, is this, you know, is it the market really their need for it? Uh, I feel like recently it's growing in popularity. You see more like YouTube stars and like these TikTok stars doing these um, boxing events. And I feel like, you know, since it's picking up, I feel like just marketing to the younger generation that, you know, like this is something fun that can keep you active and, you know, just 
they have a program to keep you active and to, you know, to help you grow. Okay. So boxing then would you incorporate uh, mixed martial arts in that yeah. too, or just focus? Yeah. All right, so that's gonna be interesting to see. Uh, boxing gym, anybody else? Anybody we left out? All right, uh, let's get back into constraint management. All right, so we say it's constraints. Constraints affects performance, right? You have all types of constraints dealing with increase in demand, not having enough people or staff on billable, uh, maybe policies in your corporation that constrain. We talked about maybe uh, ways and procedures you can go about measuring constraints. Everyone familiar with what a constraint is? Okay. So a theory of constraint, systematic management approach that focuses mainly on constraints that impedes the firm's progress towards this goal. So one of the ways of looking at constraints is if you supply a product, let's say, you know, going back to Starbucks and Dunkin' Donuts or McDonald's, right? You can say you supply products that people want more than other products, right? So you're looking at demand for particular uh, items on the menu. So kind of thinking about your um, barbecue going, right? items on the menu. So you got the business up and running, people are coming in, they're buying stuff. You start to notice like, hey, people buy a lot more of this than this particular item, right? Let's say they rarely ever buy this particular item. And it's been on the menu. What do you think you're gonna do? Uh, start to cut down, so say like, a lot of people are buying pulled pork and not buying a lot of chicken wings, just say. Like kind of just still make the chicken wings, but not as much and kind of put all that extra effort into what they are purchasing more, so like making more of the pulled pork then. Okay, and do you think eventually you'll phase out? That yeah, depending on if like the demand gets to like zero, then yeah, but if it's still, like you still want to satisfy kind of as many people as possible, so like you don't want to take it fully off the money right away. Yeah. So in case someone's like, oh, I was really coming here just for the chicken wings, like that type of thing. So you kind of just want to see where it goes, like start to minimize it, and then possibly fade out, maybe even add a new product. Yeah, so think of that. We have some products and they're not faring well as well as other products, potentially they're losing money, mm -hmm. right? So you say, I still have this up there, but if I had something else, right? The opportunity cost there, if I have the opportunity to introduce a new product, I'd be making maybe X amount of increase in profit instead of having these products on it that no one uh, wants to purchase. So companies do this all the time. You said McDonald's changed their menu. They'll add things, they'll take it out, they're testing the market, see the demand, and they'll measure the actual demand of a product over a certain period of time. If it doesn't meet the test, eventually they get rid of it and just keep their stable, right? <clears throat> Same will go with Starbucks, Dunkin' Donuts, what have you. So that's one way of increasing um, your profit and being highly efficient is constantly revising uh, what you offer, right? You're offering the same stuff and no one wants to purchase it. You don't change. If you don't adapt and change what people want, then you're gonna have a failing business and you're gonna lose a ton of money, right? So revising even products, being efficient in doing that. <clears throat> um, so you want to exploit, you want to exploit your capabilities and your capacity to do certain things when you have challenges. Which means that you basically want to take what you do well and focus on that thing, subordinate it, put all the resources and people towards something when you have experienced a bottleneck. So we said some of the measures that we have, right? Inventory, do we have enough to supply? If we do have enough, do we have too much? Right? We said too much will lead to <clears throat> waste. Waste leads to a decrease in profit. And then we talked about throughput, rate at which a system generates money through sales. An increase in throughput leads to an increase in net profit, return on investment or cash flows. 
And then your operating expense, basically if you have too many things that um, operating and they're not producing a profit, you have to go back and use revision methods in order to eliminate some of the operating expenses. But you see all the time, businesses waste a ton of money, right, by not being efficient. Uh, they buy buildings that are too large, they have too much inventory on hand, the stuff don't get sold. You see that with clothing companies, they're constantly putting things on clearance, and on sale. They have huge facilities, not enough salespeople, right? If you go into some stores, what are some stores you see, like uh, examples you've been in, you like, man, does anybody even work here? huge places where you barely see anybody even around to help you. <clears throat> Any examples? Some retail spots, yeah. Well, Walmart, but I don't think Walmart is an issue of uh, not hiring enough people. I think it's an issue of mismanaging people and encouraging like, laziness. So why do you think that is, right? Let's say Walmart is pretty, you know, when we go into these places, we think like, oh man, they just don't know. Like, you know, I mean, these are multi-billion dollar corporations. They're pretty aware of what's going on. Why do you think that is? Well, I mean, you see online like a lot of employees at Walmart um, complaining about management being, uh, having like a point system to where like if you get X amount of points, you get fired and points can be accumulated for like tardiness, calling off with, and not using your PTO or anything like that. And that it just encourages employees to be like less um, involved or less willing to put their best effort towards the company. Yeah, and you said, do you think Walmart? Let's say Walmart's looking and observing that behavior, right? <coughs> District manager, store manager, what have you. Now looking at that, why do you think they continue to let it go? I, I think it's for them. It's just easier to like hire people. Um, because they have like a ton of applicants because they're really an entry level job in terms of like store associates. So they, they just have a constant like conveyor. Turnover. Yeah. Right, let's say, hey, you're one of the district managers, you're the CEO of a region or something, the VP of a region of Walmart, right? Middle of Kansas, central Kansas or something like that. And you're looking at that happen and people are complaining and bringing towards you. And you're like, well, I really don't want them to unionize. People had stable jobs here at Walmart. They get health benefits, right? They want to stay here for a long time. Eventually, they would get together and unionize. And the unionize would pay them twenty some dollars an hour. Now, will Walmart be Walmart after you pay them twenty some dollars an hour? Their profit margins decrease, right? Will the price of the goods still be there? If they're higher, will that impact? the demand of coming to Walmart, right? <clears throat> so in some way, <clears throat> Walmart knows this. They know it's happening. <clears throat> Their methodology is to really just allow it to happen and to say it's a force of that store, right? And to say it's just a natural thing happening. There's nothing they can do about it. It could be changed, it could be better training. They use all the tactics. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, at the end of the day, Walmart's still efficient. Is it ethical? No. Absolutely unethical, right? But Walmart's always criticized for unethical practices, not wanting to pay people anything, barely having people in these gigantic stores to help the people. They know that people still buy regardless because the stuff is cheap. So they have their target market, but in, in terms of their employees, they don't want them to unionize. So the methodology to have them not unionize is to have high turnover rate and not allow people to be able to band together to unionize. Um, so they got their approach. All right? Little people, operating expenses low. We got a huge inventory. Um, let's say utilization for Walmart, really high because less people, more work, right? Less people you get to do, that means more work that they have to do. Which also means, what could be inefficient about that? <clears throat> Allowing people to take on more uh, responsibilities. Is there anything that could be inefficient? Yes. Well, if you have someone 
pretty much more you more multiple hats, then they have less time to do each task as opposed to someone designated for just one task. Yeah. So uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, division of labor, not proper division of labor, right? Mm -hmm. Anyone here ever read Adam Smith, Wealth of Nations? No Wealth of Nations? All right. To say if you read that book, um, it'll probably take away a year of school if you, if you can read that book from start to finish. So if you haven't read Wealth of Nations, read Wealth of Nations. It's the, the greatest fundamental principles of business and economics ever in history. Okay. <clears throat> So we say, hey, we got some constraints, right? We want to focus on balancing flow, not balancing capacity. Capacity was last chapter. It's talking about what all we got, resources. This is not about that. This is about focusing on uh, being efficient for uh, things that can arise to create bottlenecks, right? How to keep things moving appropriately, right? Maximizing output and efficiency of every resource towards that thing in the, in the system. Right, we said an hour loss is a bottleneck. There's an hour loss for the whole system. An hour saved is a mirage because it does not make the whole system more productive. Right, so this is really, uh, <clears throat> I would say more of a reactive approach than proactive. Right? Things will happen, so we want to be prepared and be able to react. All right, so identify the system bottleneck. One of the things is like, hey, can you properly identify what is inefficient right now at this point? You say you go <clears throat> to Starbucks and Dunkin' Donuts or McDonald's, the line is really, really long. What is happening that is disturbing this process, right? Maybe you don't know as a consumer, right? You're not supposed to know. But the people working there would be like, hey, someone called off, the, one of the machines broke, that kind of disturbed the whole system. Uh, maybe the point of service system is is disrupted. Uh, maybe there's some other, you know, something else going on within the system, right? Exploiting a bottleneck is meaning basically putting all, all of your resources towards that issue. So you want to get more people on the register, more people to help with the machine and get it done. And subordinate is all our decisions to step two, which means you just delegate all of your employment uh, workforce and time to this uh, exploitation. So that you elevate the bottleneck and do not let inertia set in. What's inertia? All right, inertia is body at rest, just doing nothing. What you see, what you see all the time, if you ever go into some restaurants and you're like, hey, the service sucks, but they don't care. Right? They're not going to do anything about it. It's like, oh, this is just how it is. If you go even to um, some of these old family-owned restaurants, you're like, man, these places are make a killing. They could make a lot of money if they just added this, this, and that. And like, they do not do that. Therefore, they get the same amount of money every week, every weekend, with no expansion whatsoever. So they have a great product that people like in the area, but they're just... There's no change, there's no adaptation, there's no growth. There's no growth, which means we could have more uh, McDonald's out there, but owners and operators of businesses just don't utilize their talents and their ideas to make that thing happen. <clears throat> That's where innovation comes in. Some people are business owners, but they're highly not innovative at all. <clears throat> Okay, they're giving us a example here, just to wrap it up. All right, Keith's Car Wash. I went to a car wash over the weekend, and uh, the line was really, really long. Ridiculous. But Keith's Car Wash offered two types of washes. Who here thinks car washes are good businesses? You think? Uh, well, I used to work at one. Many of the owners, and they would call me about the amount of money that. Yeah. Yeah, I think you need multiple locations to make it work. 
All right, Keep Star Wash offers two types of washes, standard and deluxe. The process flow for both types of customers is shown in the following chart. <clears throat> so this is called a precedence diagram, <clears throat> which basically shows which step-by-step uh, -step performance, like what are you gonna do? Here we get, um, okay, so standard's going up. So A1, A2 is part of the process of getting to this point. From here you get A3, A4. In parentheses, it's the number of minutes that it takes for the activity of the process. A5, A6, A7, and this is where you finally dry out. Okay. All right, which step is the bottleneck for the standard car wash process? Deluxe. Are you able to identify any with the bottlenecks here? Yes. Probably uh, uh, for deluxe. I mean, it takes step longer. It's kind of reasonable for um, being deluxe implies being premium, but still kind of takes like uh, I'd say like like a bit longer than standard. Obviously, just it is. I'm trying to say here, maybe uh, the value might not be as good for deluxe for what you're paying, what you're getting. Okay. I mean, a simple way of looking at this, right? You said parentheses is number of minutes. So you're looking at the time it takes in a particular step. If it takes a very, very long time in steps, how do you make that more efficient process, right? Because in reality, customers are sitting at one step for an extremely long time, in which case they may say, I'm never coming back here again. Your job as an owner operator of this car wash is to have it flow in a way that no one really notices the difference in the gas, right? And the amount of time it does it, so that it, so that it just moves, uh, it flows smoothly. Because remember we said it's about flow. How well do things flow? Anything that takes long, 20 minutes here for A6, like that's a very long time. Could they spread this out so that the time is equal? And that would make it more for uh, customers to really not complain so much about the process. Here you say 15 minutes right there, right? That A4, 15 minutes. Could you change it to make all of this 10? And that way you have a smooth process. Well, welcome back to talk about this more on Wednesday. Um, everyone have a great day. Yeah.